Well, here we are once again. It is Wednesday and the love of my life, John Grayson, with me on Valentine's Day, <laughs> which is so nice of you. <laughs> will you be mine? I will. I will, John. As long as you'll be mine, too. That will be wonderful. All right. I'll have to talk to Kathy about this. But Yeah, right. yeah. Let's see what she says. Yeah. You know, so. uh, Welcome once again, everyone, to your Wednesday night webinar brought to you by NoCD, NoCD, an online platform for the treatment of OCD and related disorders, working in countries like the US and Canada and the UK and Australia, where we have therapists ready to meet with you. And here in the US, we take more and more insurances all the time. So reach out to us at treatmyocd.com or nocd.com. And we would be happy to set up with you a free 15 minute call with one of our wonderful care team folks to see if we might be able to work with you and get you the help that you may need for OCD and related disorders. And the other thing that I always like to push to is our NoCD 411 sessions. If you have someone in your life who has OCD or related conditions, but they may not quite be ready for prime time therapy, but you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out. We can set up one of those sessions and you can get even an hour with me just to do Q and A's about OCD and related types of things as well too. So be more than happy to work with you on that. So check us out again, nocd.com. Always good to have my friend John Grayson with. Hi, John. How are you? Always fun to be here. You know, the f I love the story of this because uh, John, I had on uh, about a year and a, well, geez, over a year and almost two years ago now. And uh, afterwards I said, let's do it again. And he said, do you really want to do it again? I said, yes, John, I really want to do it again. And then I'll see. And then I sent him requests and he said, oh, you really do want to do it again? I said, yes, I told you I want to do it again. <laughs> and here we are every month doing it again. So, Who knew that Patrick was sincere? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's first for many people, actually. <laughs> so, uh, John, our first question is a 10-parter, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I you know, you I'm, I'm looking at this first part, and I am wondering something about this individual. All right. Because it sounds really, really similar to somebody who's been writing me and I've been answering. Oh. So, so, um, but maybe, maybe, maybe you're not the same person. Although, if so, it's really cool. I mean, you know, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think everybody who suffers from OCD is a unique individual. Of course. But I also usually tell them, however, the way in which you're unique is not your OCD. So good news. You're probably unique in some really good ways as opposed to, oh, my God, that's what your problem is. So it may be that the similarities between this individual and who I've written just reflects that, you know, certainly many people um, have this problem, you know, that, you know, and he's referring to having uh you know, I I, I think I, I think we're no longer calling it homosexual OCD, no, right? No, as sexual orientation OCD, S O. Right, right, right. Because SOCD. it can go many ways. It right, doesn't. we're allowing it to go any direction. However, and it does go every direction. Yeah. <laughs> so, with that in mind, um, you know, individuals wondering if they have had some feelings or not, and they're kind of doing it pretty black and white. Mm -hmm. I'm either straight or not. It's all going to answer some general ways. First of all, generally, sexuality is not 100% one way or the other. And, and, and even, you know, even for individuals who would never want an experience outside of whatever norm they've picked, but that doesn't mean they're still 100% whatever it is they're living. You know, so, um, you know, early Kinsey studies down, people tend to not be the extreme. So, Somebody may never want a straight experience or want a gay or want a gay experience, but it doesn't mean they have some, you know, attractions that way. And, you know, so if I, I you know, so I, I think the goal is not to really figure out like what is my true self because, well, I, I think it's really selfish on my part. I don't really worry about true self because I can't figure out what my true self is. So I'm just like going like, well, I can't figure out the heck. Nobody else can either. I, I might mm -hmm. be wrong on that. Because uh, yeah, for real, if I try to think what my true self is, I can't deconstruct myself to find out what is the essence. You know, like, what if I'm not a psychologist? Well, that'd be a disappointment, but that's like I'm still me. <laughs> you know, but if you know what I mean, but I'm still me. It's not like, I yeah. mean, like, it, it, it's, my, it's a lot of my like and interest, but it's not like I'm 
not John Green. So I can't figure out how to deconstruct me so I can go like, ah, there's the essence of Grayson, um, mm -hmm. a frightening thought. But, you know, so in that sense, you know, because I think and if, I think if you challenge people to describe their true self, I think they either come to one of two conclusions. One is they can't define it or they're going to go like, I just know. And I just know, and that aggravated, like, stop aggravating me with questions I can't answer, I believe is kind of code for, I can't explain it, I feel it, and I'm going to believe my feelings. So I do feel like I know me, I really do, but I, I acknowledge that just because I feel I know me doesn't mean I'm accurate, because we certainly see many people who think they're self-aware, we're going like, mm, yeah, no, you're not. So I don't know which one I am, whether I'm like, really am, or one of those people who you know, people might laugh at it's like, do you, you think you're self-aware? So going back to this guy's question, um, all we know is that um, at this moment in time, you don't have a current plan to sleep with men. You know, that, that you know, so in terms of that, that's as good as it gets. You know, they're worried about the, you know, they mentioned the religious, but um, Again, um, if they were to talk to one priest as opposed to priest shopping, they're going to say, well, you know, it, it, it's what you do. And, um, you know, within the sanctity of marriage, they don't want them sleeping with anybody else but their spouse. And the idea you may have thoughts of it, they're not really going to be concerned. We don't really get to pick who we're thinking about. You know, what makes it OCD is not oh, you know, you're OCD, so you're straight, really, and, you know, it's really fake. What makes it OCD is you're trying to figure it out, as opposed mm -hmm. to, like, mm -hmm. I love my wife. I'm going to keep sleeping with her, you know, and um, I don't know about these other feelings, but they, you know, they're not controlling me. It's, it would, you know, wouldn't be a, a sin to find a guy attractive, you know, in, the, in what he considers the worst case scenario, I find men attractive. And, in fact, let's say you decided, you know what? I really prefer men over women. Okay. But you know what? You could have that preference and stay with your spouse. Of course. Because you know, it's like, you know what? She's a great gal. And although I, I'm not you know, as attracted as I would like to be, I'm, uh, I'm going to stay with her. And I think you would keep that secret from her because you don't want to hurt her. What purpose yeah. does it serve to say, hey, honey, I love you, but really I don't want you. I want men. And, you know, so... I'm just faking it when we do it. You know, I think that would be putting your feelings above hers. I don't think that's a useful honesty. Unless you're planning to date guys for sure, in which case, yeah, then he would owe it to her to say, like, uh, guess what? I'm not going to be faithful anymore. So he could worry, is that going to happen in the future? And the answer, there are two answers. The obnoxious answer is definitely maybe. And the more accurate answer is, well, the odds are no. But ah, uh, you know, low probability events occur. Um, and the goal is to live with like, here's what I'm doing now. And yeah, I may have some mix of feelings, and I, you know, I I kind of think I'm probably more straight than not. But even if I'm not, I'm gonna choose to live this lifestyle. The, the other lifestyle, you know, I mean, plenty of people, there are plenty of marriages where people stay together for the kids. Mm. You know. They're choosing second best, you know, and um, so I think um, I can be a good practicing Catholic and um, not know for sure if I have gay feelings. And so, you know, the the exposure is like, you know, there I may have gay urges and desires. Um, I definitely have some desire for my wife and, you know, I want to learn to enjoy her for what she is because you know as a current practicing catholic my value is i'm going to be faithful to her in my behavior um none of us have control over what we find attractive so i, I can't you know i mean is it, it, it technically if you're going to say you know it's not any better if you see some hot women who you think about and find them really attractive i mean it's like all right i'm afraid finding other people attractive is normal and you know, so that, you know, that that's that yeah. happens to everybody. Yeah. 
Wow, I went on for too long. <laughs> um, one thing that's interesting, and, and I bring this up, you you talked a little bit, John, about the all or nothingness. And I've always likened this to the court system where in court, we would like to be pronounced innocent, even though we're only pronounced not guilty. Mm. So well, you like can that. be pronounced guilty, but you're never pronounced not guilty anything but not guilty you're never pronounced innocent the the mm -hmm. opposite of it right just like so what does not guilty mean oh you might be guilty but yeah, there's not enough proof of it so we're not going to say that you are right but right there could still be you know that kind right of thing. and ocd would hate that of course it would would just like no i i want to be innocent and until i'm proven innocent i feel as if i'm guilty yeah, yeah. so I hope hearing me say it was hopeful for ABF, you know, and, and whether whether he's read this or um, or this is somebody who has a very similar set of issues. MS says, if I want to be an ERP specialist, what course can I take? Maybe online. If I study a master's degree in psychology, there's no ERP specialist in your country. Well. A, we're honored that you would want to be an ERP specialist, first of all. So thank you. We, maybe maybe we've had a slight influence on that, John. That would be wonderful. <laughs> and B, uh, there are people who travel all over the world to go to programs in order to be able to specialize in things or to do practicums in certain areas. You know, one of the things that we did, and it was so fun when I was at uh, the St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute with Alec, uh, we would have visiting scholars from other countries come and do a month or two with us. Mm -hmm. And we had several uh, from Italy. We had, we had uh, our friend Liz from, from Mexico came up and did some time there too. So it was such a wonderful experience to have people from other countries come and do some training with us and be able to take some ERP back to their home country as well. And, you know, I'm sorry, did I interrupt? Were you done? No, no, I'm done. I, you know, they're actually, Probably, maybe, may, I might be underestimating, but I think I can probably count on two hands the number of programs that will actually teach exposure and response prevention in a usable way. You know that that's that's tech. You know that that's clinical and technical enough that somebody in that graduate program is is really learning it. Um, so I'm, <coughs> I think that most people. Are going to go through a program where they aren't really getting much exposure to working with OCD and ERP. And so a lot of the training they're going to get is, you know, they're going to do things like go to the OCD conference and, and try to and try to seek out training from specialized places like the OC Foundation has, you know, a consultation thing where people can, you know, consult with professionals. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can they find a place like, you know, what Alec used to offer? You know, I don't know how many places offer where somebody can do that. And and also, does somebody have time to devote to that full time versus, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be kind of cool to take a course. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's very much a model of you're, you're, you're really stuck seeking out individual supervision or, or, or going, you know, finding out where it's done and learning that way. Um, you know, and certainly, and certainly it'd be, it would, I would find it hard. I, I think the programs that offer good training in OCD, and again, I don't know that there are 10 of them. Um, they're probably PhD programs. Um, if I'm in a master's level program or a social work program or an MFT program, I'm getting that training outside of my program. The program is giving me my working degree and I have to get my training elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I would agree that's terrible, but I think that is, uh, um, I, I can't think of a place you could go. And so if there is such a place. It's not common. Yeah, even what I learned in graduate school was augmented by my postdoc, and what I learned on my postdoc is what I've done for my career. Yeah, and 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 I learned nothing useful about OCD in my graduate school. Uh, you know, my first my first exposure was on my internship 
and then and then I just happened to be so old that you know my first exposure led me to uh, a job with Edna Foe on her first OCD grant, you know, which you know, kind of set the set set the format of how we do ERP, and um, you know that's where I learned how to be a specialist, you know, so. You know, which is the same place Alec was, right? He did an he yep. did an internship there at in back in the beginning, in the ancient days, <laughs> when Joe was still there too. <laughs> oh God, yes. Adam says, uh, "I rent my house to four tenants, and I live in a different city myself. I constantly worry that they might damage the house, like flood it or burn it or break it. I can't stop thinking about it." You know, I wonder if that's most uh, landlords. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I hate, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I really feel like Adam is an ideal. He, what he's asking is the heart of OCD treatment. That's and why. Because, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and the issue is not, you know, you're, you're kind of saying, I don't want to worry about that. Right. And there is a way to learn to not worry about it, which is to say, which is to get comfortable with the idea of like, all that can happen. I mean, you're not crazy. It could. All Every one of those happen. things. Every one of those and, things. Mm -hmm. And and the and literally the only thing you can do is that this might happen and I will cope with it. I mean, I think, Adam, you have this one thing about your obsession that's really great. You're obsessing about something that probably insurance would cover most of it. Mm -hmm. or, 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 you know, or, or, you know, I mean, like, you, you know, you could have a fear where it's like this terrible things happen. And I would say the exact same things that you have to decide. I want to cope with the worst if it happens. Yours, I mean, it would be a pain in the neck. Absolutely be upsetting. You could be upset, but the answer mm -hmm. to every time you have the worry is to, is, is to learn to get comfortable. I know I said, learn to get comfortable with then yourself. Yes, that might happen. This is a part of life. I have to learn to live with. You know, I'm, I'm assuming you don't worry constantly about getting named and killed in a car crash, but you know, that could happen Absolutely. and your goal, 100%. your planet, your plan is like, okay, I hope it doesn't happen and I'm not going to deal with it. And the same thing is like to repeat myself from week to week, all you have are the odds. Most of the time there's not severe, horrible damage from tenants. But sometimes there is, and there's no escape from that. So, you know, when you say you can't stop thinking about it, that says to me, you keep talking about how much you don't want it to happen as opposed to, well, what would I do if it happened? And, you know, because you actually have no choice. You will do something if it happens. So, so the plan would really be, I want to learn to get comfortable with that. I may have to deal with a really sucky situation. Mm -hmm. I, I love saying to people, you'll figure out a way to handle it. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've had shitty situations in my life, ones that I didn't think I'd have to ever deal with. I figured mm -hmm. out how to handle it. I was not an expert in cancer treatment, uh, yeah. but I, I figured out how to handle it. Right? I made mistakes along the way, figured out how to handle those. And you know what? Oh, my you, God. You move I'm along. sorry. Yeah. Well, read James. James? Okay. Thank you for taking time or you're busy to answer this question. I'm having really bad anxiety about getting a tattoo. Oh, well. <laughs> Jeez. If I, 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 James, I, 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 um, the reason I'm laughing is because this year, age 71, Look at that. I, I got two tattoos. I am done. I just needed the two, you know, one of the symmetry. And <laughs> I was um, say, gotta even it up, right? <laughs> and there's a there's a color scheme, you know, they both have red, but they're very different. Um and I guess there are a few answers. I mean, you know, I know I can tell which people some people think it's really cool. I like them. Some people I know dislike it, but nobody has the courage to tell me. But the way I know they dislike it is the people who dislike it, they'll look at it and they hear I got a tattoo, let's see, and they go like, oh, that's really big. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah, they don't like it. And what do they think of me? 
Well, I don't really get to control what anybody thinks of me. I mean, and I know Patrick will agree with this. I know there are some people who think I'm an arrogant asshole. I will agree with that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I know exactly what they're talking about. And, you know, there's some people, those exact same traits that other people are picking on, other people really like about me. Yep. So, um, and so my thought is, what do I think about other people doing X or Y? You know, because if I'm not, you know, if I, you know, what, what, what do I think it's bad to get a tattoo? Do I judge other? What do I think of, you know, if I had a friend who got a tattoo and I heard somebody say something negative about that friend, what, what, what would I think about the person making the judgment against my friend? You know, so yeah, they're definitely, and, and depending on how old you are, there's definitely going to be people who do that. I mean, I'm old, so, you know, 71, uh, that, that's uh, on the older side. Um, so generally what I do, I, I mean, I, I can go nowhere where everybody's going to like me. And so I think you have to accept two things. Yeah, some people are going to think terribly of you. I don't know what they're going to think, but, you know, like, why would you do something stupid like that and mark up your skin or or what are you trying to show off or whatever? Um, and, and I generally think of, and I've talked about this before on the show, the five magic words. You know? <laughs> I know what they are. <laughs> I know. You know, and, and, and I think these are generally, generally I encourage it to be an in your head thought, yeah. but if it's not, you know what, in your head, and you want to verbalize it, it's fine. And I like to be generous, you know, because I'm generally thinking if so-and-so is thinking this about me, because yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but if so-and-so is thinking this about me and then the five magic words, they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> now, people always mess this up. I tell my clients this and they in very and I give them the warning I'm giving you now. And then next week they will mess it up. Because I'll say, what are the five magic words? And they'll say, I don't give a fuck. And it's like, no, that's mm -hmm. not true. You do care. It does bother you. We're not trying to make up something, but they can go fuck themselves as something you can get behind. You can have that kind of anger, to, you know, with yourself. So I am, as you know, funny as it sounds, dead serious because it's not like you or I have a choice. Whatever I do, somebody is going to think badly of me. Some people love the things I say and other people think it's like, oh, God, he's so full of himself. And um. I, I have the five magic words and I, I let people think whatever they're going to think. Sometimes it's a disappointment. Sometimes somebody I might really like thinks badly of me. But I can't do anything about that. Like, it's like, okay, that's a disappointment, you know? And, and so I have to live with that. Um, if you because find if a you, way to, if yeah. you did try to do something about that and you changed for them, then everyone else might not like you because now you weren't being your genuine self. Well, forget genuine self. Remember, I don't know what that is. Yeah, right. But, okay. but, 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 but I like, I like to, be, I like to be the self that I feel comfortable with and have less of, you know, in my awareness that it's less of an act because at least the people who like me, like me for the way I'm comfortable versus I have to worry, like I'm putting on this act and what if I don't, you know, what if I'm not acting right? So so in uh, behaving as uh, in my fashion, at least at least people who seem to like me, like me for me, mm -hmm. you know, and I say seem to like me to go full OCD on it's like, well, I don't actually know. It's just seems like it. And I'm, I'm going to treat it as if it's true. Very good. My, uh, let's see. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for hosting. My OCD tries to give me a new mental health disorder almost every day, listing off a whole bunch of them. Uh, realizing it has helped a little. You try to discourage. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You've had some therapists say that we can eliminate some of these disorders from your worries, but that didn't help for long. You're working on starting therapy with a clinician again soon. Okay. That was a little disjointed, but um, uh, the, we see this a lot, of course, and, and you know we hear a lot about 
what if I suddenly become psychotic or something like that? You know, I was watching yeah. the news and this mild mannered person one day went into work with a gun and shot 78 people. And what if, what if I do that tomorrow or something of that nature? Yeah. I, I think it's a terrifying thing Anya can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she has an awareness that she does this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, perhaps incorrectly, that the underlying issue is whichever mental disorder I suddenly think I'm having has to be worked on. Otherwise, I'm never getting better. So what if it's this? What is that? You know, and and because you know, if it's if they're treating the wrong disorder, then that is terrible. So rather than eliminating disorders, um, I would be taking the risk of letting the therapist decide what we're working on. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, and not trying to say, what about this symptom or that? Like, like right. putting it in their hands and, and hoping that you've picked a decent therapist. I mean, that could suck. You could pick the wrong therapist, but Hey, you can have any of those disorders and pick the therapist who's wrong for treating it. So we can have an entire other obsession of like, does this therapist who claims they treat this, are they really treating this? But I, I think you're stuck putting it in their hands and letting them choose from your description, the behaviors that they're going to work on. Um, and, and, and kind of, hope that that's going to improve life and and i say improve life instead of get you better or recovered or cured because i think like i think we can improve your life but if we can say those other words you're going to obsess so it's kind of like okay i'm i'm shooting for life just improving and i hope this approach works but but I, of course what i'm saying isn't like you can just do it like that you're going to actually have to make an effort. You're going to have to like, why am I going to trust this guy? Because I have this whole other set of things like it's disasters. Why am I going to take this risk? So you're going to have to come up with the reasons to take the risk, which are generally like, oh, this other way I keep doing things, even though it seems important, is screwing up my life more. So let's try to find a new way to potentially screw up your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's the whack-a-mole experience of OCD. Just when you mm -hmm. maybe feel like you got so close and, oh, here's the new thing. It's like, oh, darn. Love is 515. I always think that God had a reason he gave me OCD, so maybe I should give it attention and importance. I wonder if you would feel that way about cancer or about uh, COPD or various things as well, too. And, and not to say, I'll say this, not to say that having something doesn't mean that you could try to take something good out. There's plenty of people with OCD who have turned their life toward wanting to treat OCD and take advantage of what they've learned from their own treatment and apply that to other people as well, too. So if we're talking about it like that, that's one way. But I, I have seen people who have also said, well, if if everything comes from God, then, then it is important to really embrace the OCD and to give it its full potential uh, and have been so stymied by the OCD that they've not even been able to function and have required residential care. Uh, in in order to try to break through some yeah. of the the stuff, yeah. and, so, and of course those people are committing blasphemy, right? Mm -hmm. Because if God gave me OCD, and and I think if I believe in God, I I am pretty much deciding that this is somehow part of His plan. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the one thing we can be think with a high degree of probability that. I choose to trust God because if I have a God I don't trust, it's like, well, I'm screwed. So, you know, I'm going to trust God. But it's really clear that he has a complex plan that's impossible for me to understand. So he may have given me OCD, but what does he want me to learn from my OCD? I don't get to know that. I would suggest that overcoming OCD and living with uncertainty uh, I mean, that, I mean, I'm not saying it is, but I could say that would be the lesson God wants you to learn because if I live with uncertainty, I'm saying I trust God in whatever he does. So even if it ends up sucking for me, I, you know, I still think my soul's safe with him and I'm trying to do my best. And from that perspective, overcoming OCD would end up, you know, would actually end up making you more faithful to God because you're giving it to God and living with uncertainty as opposed to trying to get control. 
you are trying to know the mind of God. And let's say that everything I'm saying might be wrong, but it's not like we know which one's right. So by, I, I think by definition, I, I get to trust God. Not that everything's going to turn out, but like <clears throat> he's got a good plan and it's not to screw me and I'm keeping my finger across that I'm good enough. Um, so when you say give it attention and importance, I don't know if you mean embrace it as Patrick was saying or fight it. I I kind of think that I think that since I can live a more full life fighting OCD and I can be more giving to other people, it feels like fighting OCD makes me more, it you know, makes me better in any community. So that that feels like that would be a, a more God path than getting making my life miserable from anxiety and, and, and not functioning, I think. There's a, a song that I love, just a, a quick turn on scrupulosity. Uh, it's by a group named Ash and Bloom. <clears throat> They're a Canadian group. They unfortunately broke up. They were, they were amazing, but they wrote a song called heaven is a ghost town. And it's basically that uh, the only person in heaven is God because if you can only get in heaven by trying to be like God, then you've failed. And therefore God's pretty alone up there sitting around twiddling his thumbs, waiting for anyone to get in and nobody actually makes it in. So it's, it's a great song to check out. If you yes. Want. The video is really good too. This is a fun one. If you could say one helpful thing to someone who has mental compulsions, a very loud head and ruminates, what would it be? Well, you know, I'm, I, 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 you want me to answer that first? It looks like. Oh, um, either. Or. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's always the same thing. Um, one thing, God, I have such a big mouth. Do we ever get me to say <laughs> one thing? Holy no, God. I don't know. That's ever happened. I, we could ask Kathy; she would probably agree on that statement as well, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I mean, because because I have, a, I, I, I feel like I have at least two. You know, which is, I'll give you two. I'll give you two. Okay. Um, most of the time, my compulsions don't work. Mm -hmm. So I would like to work on learning on living with uncertainty. Now, I think there are a lot of correlates, and that answer explodes out into a lot of other things. But I guess that would be my starting point. Mm hmm. Which, which which leads into the next person, really. Yeah, yeah. I'll just throw on, on Naomi's first before we go. Uh, the I think the other piece, too, is that hearing something in my head doesn't mean it requires attention. True. Yeah. And you and I have used the tinnitus example for that uh, right. a lot, right? That right. We both hear something that nobody else hears. And it doesn't require us to pay attention, which we are now because I said tinnitus. And so it's. Oh, yeah. I, I was about to point out. Yep. Yeah. Now I hear it. <laughs> yeah. But it will still be there in 10 minutes. We may and we will be hearing it. But we may not. We may or may not notice it. There you go. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, there's there's lots of things loud in our head and there's ruminations and things. But. They, they can be there without requiring us to pay lots of attention to them. Mindful mind. Oh, bad thought. Right off the bat, the word, the phrase bad thoughts is always. Uh, oh, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, but it's, it's the rest of it. Yeah. It's the way, it's the way mindful mind ends. And yeah, I'm going to say it. So bad thoughts about my past mistakes are difficult to deal with. Nobody is perfect. I know. I just cannot accept myself like that. And Specialness, so, one of my favorite things in the world. The rules well, of the world apply to me differently than everybody else. Yeah, and I and I, I, this might sound glib. I John, you not. have never been glib in your life, so this will be a first, actually. So that'll be fascinating. My God, that would be cool if that were true. <laughs> <fact. laughs> um, I believe that you can't simply accept those things, but you could have the goal of, I want to learn how to accept that. Because if you're going to, if you're not going to work on it, 
If you're going to say, I just can't stand that and I refuse to work on it, you don't need treatment because you're never getting better. Like getting mm -hmm. better requires not that you do it today, but that you make that a goal. And if you say, I don't know how to do that, well, one is always hoping that us therapists are good for something. Yes. But, but, um, so the very first step is like, oh, if I want to have a life, I need to do it. Uh, because if I'm, if I'm not going to try to do that, then this is forever. I'm interested in what you'd say about this, John. There, there are times that I say to people, I'm probably not going to tell you much that you haven't heard already, but I'm hoping that I'm going to be more convincing than everybody else has been. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and, and I, and I, I, and, and I said, I didn't want to sound glib, <laughs> but I did want to be blunt to make it really clear. Yeah. Like, I can't negotiate. I can't make the truth, not the truth, you know? And so it's like, it's like, okay, then you can stay this way forever, mm -hmm. but you don't have to. I, I've i asked people sometimes who say bad thoughts about past mistakes. Uh, and so they think of themselves potentially as bad people for having made mistakes. I've, I've, I've asked people how many years of punishment are required as penance for the previous mistake. And then why don't you ring me up after that, uh, after those years, right? And they, they chuckle and they say, well, uh, it's been 15 already. Well, maybe another seven. And then, then we could try, you know, but is, is there ever enough punishment for OCD? The answer is no, of course not. Uh, there, there isn't, you can, you can always add a little bit more to the, yeah. to the, I, you know, cause I think, I, cause I think forgiving oneself doesn't mean I feel good about the thing that I did. Oh, bad. yeah. I, I will always feel awful about it. Mm -hmm. Forgiving myself means I feel like I kind of understand how it happened and I hope that I'm different now and, and I'm a different person. So I wouldn't do that again. So I, I forgive that earlier version of myself, but yeah, when I think about it, it makes me sick to my stomach. That's mm -hmm. okay. So, so that, that's part of getting better. It's like, yeah, I, I don't like talking about that. That's icky. Well, and, and, Going back to an earlier question too about, we have colleagues who can talk about what their life was like when OCD was raging, who are now therapists, who talk about the hours their family spent doing compulsions mm. with them and for them and trying to appease them and everything, and how they look back at that and go and say, I, I that I feel terrible that mm -hmm. uh, what I and yet imagine if that's all they did was just feel terrible, they would now not be in the field trying to help other people overcome it. Mm -hmm. So it you can feel bad about something and still do good in the world at the same time. It is it is not have to be mutually exclusive. Right. Mm -hmm. Steven says, today my anxiety was through the roof. I know it's money related. It's also due to letting my ex-wife borrow a credit card, and I know she will max it out and you're freaking out. Well, there. There may be some lessons there. Uh, number one, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We suddenly became a marriage advice or a, a previous marriage advice, Joe. Maybe. But I think there's this. If you know she will max it out and you're freaking out versus what if somebody would do something, right? And so... I, I know for myself, I think, John, you would agree. We deal a lot in the what if world. That's that's where our world is. Uh, we don't we don't deal a great deal in the nose because the people who come into our office or onto our virtual screens don't often tell us. I know exactly that they what if is where where we really are kind of focused on. Right. And so. But, yeah. But if he knows. Yeah. I think the plan the realistic plan is she's going to max it out. I am going to be upset. I'll accept that. But, you know, and I will survive this and I'm going to be upset and pissed off. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's the world I have to decide to live in now because that's the world that is. It's like I keep, I'm kind of like, I can't believe, you know, and I'm we're going into some she's going to do. It's like, I can't believe I'm stuck with this. It's like, yeah. okay, that's a little bit of denial because right. like you're telling me, I know the reality, but I don't want to believe the reality. I don't like that. It's yeah. like, freak, it's like, okay, I'm going to make it through that. And um, all I can do is what am I going to do tomorrow? Yeah. You know, she's going to max it out. What do I do next? Mm -hmm. You know, outside of canceling the card immediately. Right. But um, and, and next month when we're in the same position, do I hand it over again or do I say? Yeah. Hey, yeah. 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 Debit card in the future. Yeah. Um, Limit to $100. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like, again, I can be upset about something, but I have to decide I want to live with that real something. You know, to, to say I don't want reality, you know, when we're talking about it's not even what it, but you're saying it's a reality and I don't want the reality to exist. That's the statement of denial because I'm comparing the real world to the world I wish for that will never happen. So I'm always stuck like coming back to the second best world, acceptance, right? Acceptance sucks. It's like, right. okay, second best world. Best world is like she didn't spend it. This is the world where she maxed it out. I have to make the best of that world because I don't have any other world. Is yeah. that easy? Mm -hmm. No. I, you know, we're, I'm, we're talking broad and you might be saying like, how do I do that? Great question that we, Patrick or I would have to ask you a bunch of questions to help you guide through that. We're giving you kind of like... Mm -hmm. Well, here's the overarching thing. And yes, I don't mean to make it sound easy, but if you're not going to even try to do that, then you're never getting there. Right. There, I <laughs> I love your idea of the best world. You know, And the first thing that popped into my head was Mel Brooks. It's good to be the king. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the, the reality is, I, I think even people who, other people might look at thinking they live in the best world. They even yeah. they would say there there are things. Right. By the way, I love four four fifty nine p.m. Alec. All right, let's go. Alec Paul. No, I am so high. I, would, I, I did yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know. I I I'm not sure. Yeah, that's my four fifty nine. Oh, Alec. Yeah, I'm so hyper focused. It says nope, nope. I'm not nope. sure how I. I'll just read it rather than torture you. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how I can stay uncertain oh, yeah. when I feel so much pain. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Ooh, okay. Alec did too at four fifty nine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, um. So so. I'm not. I'm I, no, I understand I'm, exactly what he's yeah. saying. Okay. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering if he understands. I, you know, I, again, I talk about denial a lot. And again, I want to be clear because, you know, psychologists have a crappy definition. Most psychologists can't define it. I define denial as comparing reality to a fantasy. And, you know, whenever we do that fantasy, so much better because we don't put any crap in the fantasy except the fantasy never comes true. Yeah. So so acceptance, acceptance sucks. Second best world because it's like, wait, the thing I don't want is true. So the reason I'm calling your statement denial is you make it sound like there's an alternative to uncertainty. Right. Well, you know, John, can I add one thing before you go? Of course, Alec because I talk did, too much. No, no. Alec did say something earlier. This is a continuation of Alec's other 459. Oh, okay. Can, wait, can yeah. I just read you that one? Mm -hmm. Which is, I'm so hyper-focused on all of my bodily functions, like my breathing and heartbeat, that I am literally feeling pain in my body. I've gotten a physical and two EKGs that all come back negative. I'm not sure I can stay uncertain when I feel so much pain. Mm. So, so, okay. That makes it a little easier mm -hmm. i thought it was more uncertainty in general shows how careful i read things um <laughs> and, and i don't know which uncertain you're talking about alec um I, I think when you say you're focusing on those sensations um you're focusing on them as potential symptoms that mean something's wrong with you and and i believe in your pain you know that 100 percent. You, know, you, you know yeah you know, so I'm not questioning whether the pain is. I mean, what we currently are led to believe about your pain 
is that it's not a disease process. And, you know, to say it's not a disease process is not to say it's fake. It's just to say it's not a disease process. And it means that if you go for a million medical tests, the final result's going to be, well, something might be wrong, but we don't know what it is. And we think it's not going to kill you. So there's nothing to do. And you know what? There are a ton of disorders that are not diagnosable that actually have that truth. You know, so you 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 know, and and so what what we the most likely worst we could say or best worst the most likely worst we could say about your situation is that if something is going on that's clearly undiagnosable. So when you say I don't know if I can stay uncertain, it's like you don't have a choice. You've gone to the doctors; they don't know. And you know what? The fantasy, like if I go to enough doctors, someone will find it. That is possible. The magic, like, oh, the person finally found out what's wrong with me and now I'm cured. That happens, but really rarely. So it's a low probability event. It's like the lottery. Mm -hmm. So the bigger mm -hmm. thing is like you can spend a lot of money going tons of times and not find anything out. Your attention to it is will increase the intensity of the pain. So in the worst case scenario, there is some kind of process going on that's not diagnosable, presumably not going to kill you because they're not finding anything diagnosable. You will make the pain worse by the way you're coping with it. So, so in the worst case scenario, I'm suggesting that approaching this differently, you could lessen the experience of pain but not get rid of it if it's a real process going on. Because what you're stuck with is I have to wait for it to get worse in some way for something to come up in my diagnosis. Uh, and until that time, like, I don't, you know, you don't have a choice about uncertainty. It's there. Doctors don't know. Um, so that, that's going to be our goal. Now, the other possibility that would be really cool, and nobody can tell you whether this one, is the way you're approaching things making you so tense that yes you are creating muscle yeah. pain yeah. that's uh torturing you and um and i don't know how likely it is that we can like relax the pain away i would never promise that to you i i would be focusing on let's have you learn to cope with the pain and have it help you know help you learn to have it interfere less with life and that that should lessen the pain. I don't know if it lessens it enough. It could be less or it could be really less. Um, but I feel like, because if, if you're just stuck with this pain and nobody knows what to do, and that's the way it's going to be forever, if that's the way it is, what's your plan? One plan is be miserable forever and say, I can't live like this and destroy my life. And the secondary plan that really sucks is like, I have to find a way to live with this pain, which is, you know, what I'm saying. And I think, again, like everything, I, I feel like it's likely that you would need a good therapist to help you learn how to do that. You know, they have to take seriously that you feel in pain and we're not trying to discover the pain. We're trying to learn how to live with it. I think of the extreme what I uh, in this John is is someone like who's maybe lost an arm or a leg who is experiencing phantom limb pain mm -hmm. right where it's not even there and they feel they feel it so right. I I absolutely agree with you we we are not doubting the feelings that you're having right in in any way we we absolutely believe that you feel the things that you feel but that's very different than what we're going to do from a treatment where John and I are not going to focus on how can we alleviate the pain, physical pain that you're feeling. We're, we're actually probably going to do something very different. We're going to try to get you to run toward it instead of away. I, in a situation like this, I'd probably consider interoceptive exposures. I'd say, let's have you purposely breathe weird, or let's get your heart rate up on purpose to teach you how you can actually handle those types of experiences without sitting there worrying about what if my breathing changes? What if my heart rate goes up? I mean, I even remember one time working with someone who was in terrible shape, 
way overweight and cardiovascular issues and everything. And it was all driven by a fear of what if my heart rate goes up and that kills me. And, and by therefore not exercising or not doing anything, put himself in horrendous shape. And doctors kept saying, you need to exercise. You need to do all these things. And he's like, oh no, I can't. Cause if I do, then I'm going to die. Right. So I, uh, I, I'm always fascinated by anxiety and where it will take people even into situations that are totally bad for them, convincing them it's the best thing for them. I agree. <laughs> we have nine minutes left. Is there any uh, particulars, John, that we're sitting out there for you? Oh, let me just interested? jump down. Um, Oh, ABF says, Dr. Grayson, my apologies. This is the person that's been writing to you. You're sorry. He says, I'm sorry. Your advice is just too darn good to resist. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and what I want to say to ABS is don't, you don't have to apologize, but you have discovered that I'm boringly consistent. Yes. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it wouldn't be really funny if I gave you completely different advice. And then, then you would have really had to obsess like, but wait, you said, but. But I have a limited repertoire. Um, I like Allen's at 720 my time, 520 your time. Okay. Oh, 520. Okay. I'm getting down there. I think it's good that sometimes we jump down because sometimes we never get to yeah. the later people. Allen. Allen. Okay. By the way, you notice he capitalized my name and not yours. Yes. Yes. I get, I feel that, that was, that was good. That was good. And and I have no C uh, either in my name. <laughs> so that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, I value car safety a lot and being conquering driving OCD and driving all the time. Excellent. Wonderful. Good job. What to do when a scary event came and it's outside of OCD theme. What happened? A group came to my car and literally started brushing my windshield. When I said, no, I feel so traumatized. I keep ruminating on why it happened to me. Uh, Alan, I'm just curious. Do you think that it happened to everyone else at every single light as well, too? Or is this one of those notions where sometimes in our anxiety, we focus on why did this have to happen to me? And again, some of that specialness idea. Now, I'm wondering what everybody else at every red light did when that happened. They all might have said, Please know that some might have said, thank you so much. I couldn't see out of my windshield and gave him a couple of bucks. Others maybe didn't have any reaction, just stared straight ahead and did nothing whatsoever. Uh, I say this, Alan, and John, I'd love your opinion on this. Sometimes we want to blame the fact that people came over to my windshield and started brushing that that is the bad thing. And I would say that is a neutral thing subject to the interpretation of anybody experiencing it, because I'm going to bet numerous people experienced it throughout the day and had very different reactions than Alan did. So are we, are we going to say that was a bad thing? Or are we going to learn how to handle the fact that while driving and doing things, sometimes something will happen and I'm going to have to learn how to handle all of those things. But, I'm going to agree. I'm going to say it was a bad thing. Okay. For him. Mm -hmm. But but I have to cope with bad things. And 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 yep. you know, um, I mean I feel like I, I don't know if, again the why it happened to me. I don't know if that's kind of an effort to imagine like there was something I could have done that maybe would have changed this outcome. I think that's unlikely, as Pat said, like they probably were doing it to multiple people. And um You know, when you say it was traumatized, and, and I'm gathering there's some feeling of of uh, violation and an intrusion because they were, you know, attacking your vehicle in a sense. I understand they weren't attacking, attacking. Um, so, so I think I think when you know, I, I it suggests you kind of it may be outside of you know, be above and beyond your usual OCD that you with like way more control over your environment than is possible. You know, that, that they, they violated your car. Um, I, I think it could have been way worse. 
So I, you know, I, I think, I think I'd like to, you know, talk about, you know, have you kind of explore with yourself, like, I don't have to like that, but why, what, what, what makes it so upsetting to me? Well, you know, like Patrick was talking, like there are probably a lot of other people who went through this and cope differently. Uh, it'd be kind of cool to figure out why were they able to tolerate it and not me? They mm -hmm. probably didn't like it. You know, I would not like it. It's like, oh Christ, but yeah. I wouldn't be traumatized. I'm going down and Alan has some more to say. Uh, people uh, were interacting with, with Alan too and says, uh, the real event that happened, OCD attached to it and says, what if they punctured my tire or tampered with it and then I would have gotten in a car accident? The original event was real and aggressive, but it's the aftermath of worrying of what if something bad would have happened to my car that causes uh, or, or wondered, like, should he even report it to the authorities or something of that nature, right? So I... If if we know anything about OCD, it can take, here's an event, and now here's every what if that could have come with it. And it feels so overwhelming, even if none of them happened, the notion of what if it could have happened is enough to cause people to just want to shrink inside themselves and not even go out and live their life anymore. Yeah. And, and again, the, the, the core issue is all you have are the odds. All those what ifs possible. They generally don't happen, so probably you were lucky. And um, if you had reported it to the authorities, they would have laughed at you. Mm -hmm. Like you'd have to have the punctured tire or the – you'd have to have some more damage to your car that was really overt that you didn't have to study. So I don't really get the choice. you know. And, of course, if something bad happened to your car, you actually don't know if they did it or something someone else did it at some other time. But all we have are the odds. Most of the time, that's not happening. People where they get it destroyed, their car in some way. And so I have to live with the possibility that that something something might be bad. What saves me always is luck. You know, I always say to parents, what saves our children? Luck. Most yeah. of the time they don't get killed in a car crash. They don't get a dread disease. They don't break their head falling down the stairs. But sometimes it happens. Yeah. This is like an example like that. Like most of the time what you fear didn't happen, but yes, it might. And you want to live in that second best world where crap like this happens because the other world probably doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. And Helen even says, uh, if only I'd taken another road or turned when they were approaching, I wouldn't have been harassed by them. All right. Ooh, 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 yeah. ooh, go, ooh, go, 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 go. Sorry, yeah. I have to go. I have to go for this one. I know you do. That's why I said it. Because I, 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 I always I always like to argue against regret. Yeah. Because again, yep. I'm creating a fantasy world. There you go. And my favorite example that I beat people up with all the time is imagine that I happen to be seeing somebody, you know, a woman in therapy who was in a five-year abusive relationship where every other week the guy beat the crap out of her. And, you know, she says, John, you know, a few weeks into this, I kind of saw her coming. I wish I left. And I would say, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. and she'd look at me like, why? I said, well, for all we know, five years ago, you know, the way you were and the problems you have, you were somebody who would get into this kind of relationship. How do we know that if you left, you would not have gotten into a worse relationship? Mm -hmm. You might have gotten a better, but it might have been worse. So going a different way, maybe somebody would not have done it. Or maybe going a different way, nobody would have attacked your car that way, but a truck would have rammed you and killed you. Exactly. Like, like in the, you know, so if I'm going to compare an alternative reality, I have to recognize turning out better is definitely one option. But turning out worse is also an option. Always an option. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've used the example of if if I'm driving and I there's a yellow light and it's one of the perfect yellow lights, right? Like if I went, no mm. one would have thought I blew the light. If I stopped, everyone would have said oh, there was a perfect stop. No, nothing to worry about. And there's a car behind me, and then the light turns green. I go, and then the car behind me gets hit by a semi that lost its brakes and is everyone's killed. Is it my fault? that the people behind me died because I stopped at the yellow light. And some people would say, sure. And the, okay, now let's say I went through the yellow light and then the car that was behind me now is in front and the car behind them is the one that's killed. Is it my fault that the people in that car died because I went through the light, right? So you, 
you know, you could take this to anywhere whatsoever and always find blame for yourself. And boy, if OCD isn't good at that, I don't know what it's not good at because that is definitely one thing that it loves to do. How can I find you at fault and blame you for that and then use that against you all as fuel to do more compulsions in the future? Yeah. I think it's just likely that I'm accidentally harming people one way or another, no matter what I do. Yeah. So I'd like to not have OCD. So at least when I harm people, it, my life's less miserable. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, everyone, you've spent another hour of your life with these two morons. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> Is that any more and more like car talk every yeah, week. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Click and clack the OCD brothers. Here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we thank you for being yes, here with us. You. John, always good to see you again. And uh, we'll see you in, in a month from now. And Monday. And Monday, I'll see you with our no CD folks as well, too. That'll be great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. We'll talk to you later. Take care, all. Be well. Enjoy.